All right, everyone. Welcome so much to our seminar today. My name is Cinnamon Moffat. I am the research program manager here at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center. And again, thank you so much for being here for our speaker uh, this afternoon. A couple of quick reminders. This is a hybrid event, so welcome to the folks online as well. Um, for folks online, your cameras, mics, and screen shares have been disabled, but please put any questions you might have, um, technical questions about not being able to hear or something like that into the chat box. That's also the place that you can put any questions for today's speaker. Our volunteer, Roseanne, will read those out um, when we get to our questions and answer, um, and so we can get those questions answered for you. Um, for folks in the room, uh, just raise your hand when we get to the question and answer section, and I'll bring you a mic, and then those folks online can hear those questions as well. I also wanted to do a couple of really um, great announcements that we've got going on. So I don't know if you've seen in some of the emails that we've sent, but we have a special invited guest coming next week. Um, it is our 2004 HMSC Laverne Weber Prize winner, uh, Rod for Judah. He is the Associate Vice President and Lead Senior Scientist with the Environmental Defense Fund. Um, and so he will be here for a couple of days. He will be doing a Science on Tap on May 8th um, about can the ocean fight climate change and then be doing a special seminar with us on May 9th at 11 in this room about seaweed, blue carbon, are we ready or not? Um, so we're just really excited that this individual is able to join us for a couple of days. And so I'm hoping that you all can join us as well. Um, but for today, I wanted to introduce today's speaker. Um, many of you know this individual. He's been around for a little while, um, but David Millinger is a professor and senior researcher with the Cooperative Institute of Marine Ecosystems and Resource Studies, SIMMERS is what we call that, um, and it's also an affiliate with MMI here at the Hatfield Marine Science Center. He has a BS in mathematics and a BS in um, phys uh, philosophy. <laughs> um, from MIT and a PhD in computer science from Stanford uh, University. Dave has worked on acoustic signals and processing since 1987 and acoustic detection, classification, and localization of marine mammals since 1992. He has developed a variety of new methods in this field and has implemented these and many of other existing methods into several software packages. The most popular of these packages Packages, Ishmael has been um, used worldwide by thousands of researchers to study vocalization, distribution, and behavior of marine mammals. He has also led or participated in many uh, passive acoustic field research projects to detect, classify, and locate marine mammals in the uh, Atlantic, Pacific, Arctic, Indian, and Southern Oceans. These projects have employed a variety of passive acoustic technologies, including fixed moored hydrophones, cabled hydrophone arrays, quasi-fixed real-time hydrophones, uh, drifting sewn buoys, and most recently gliders, and has um, covered many species of marine mammals. And so Dave, the floor is yours. Turn on your mic and we'll let you go from there. Great, thank you, Cinnamon. Is this on? Yep, okay. All right, uh, I'm here to talk about using gliders for marine mammal acoustic monitoring. Uh, I've done a lot of this work with Celine Fragosi, who was a graduate student here first, and then um, she has been working with me as a, as a researcher ever since. Uh, and uh, um, she continues to do a lot of stuff with gliders and marine mammal acoustic monitoring. So uh, why do we use acoustics um, for studying marine mammals? Uh, compared to visual monitoring, Acoustic methods um, can cover large areas. You can hear quite a long distance in the ocean. Uh, can cover long time spans. Um, you can put instruments out for a year at a time, or in the case of gliders, for months at a time. It's relatively cheap um, because the instruments are typically autonomous once they're out there. Uh, it's not affected by a lot of the things that, that affect visual um, surveys, uh, fog and haze, sun angle, swell, daylight, waves, observer variability. There are things that do affect the, the um, Acoustic monitoring, you know, noise in the ocean from wind and waves and ships and whatnot. Uh, so, you know, there, there are issues for it, but, um, but it's a very good way to, to monitor marine mammals. What do we measure? Uh, often, we're, a lot of the surveys I work on, we're measuring distribution, spatial temporal distribution. 
of marine mammals on different time scales, um, daily sometimes, seasonal, year to year, decadal sometimes when we have long data sets. Um, populations, uh, we're um, working on population density estimation methods for gliders for moving platforms. Uh, and when you're measuring populations, you, you know, the best thing is to measure the absolute population, know how many are out there. Um, sometimes you just want relative measures um, to know has the population gone up 10% or 25% or whatever or not. Uh, and sometimes it's just a trend. Is the population going up or down? Often managers need that information more than anything else to know if they need to um, change what they're doing. And then movement, again, on all those all those different time scales. Um, you know, how are marine mammals moving around? How are marine mammal populations moving around? Uh, so why do we do this kind of monitoring? Um, conservation and management. You know, like I said, people need to know populations, trends, distributions, movement. Also, I work a lot with NOAA folks, and I'm part of a branch of NOAA. Um, NOAA has obligations under the law to do various um, uh, monitoring of marine mammals. Uh, from the Marine Mammal Protection Act, NOAA has to do these things called stock assessments, looking at how many individuals there are in, in given areas of the ocean. Um, people now also work on species distribution models a lot. Uh, also the Endangered Species Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, and there are a bunch of other um, laws that apply. Um, and so NOAA has to comply with those and is very interested in um, marine mammal um, monitoring. So gliders for, for acoustic monitoring. How do we use gliders? Well, how do how do gliders work? Uh, this diagram on the right kind of shows how gliders work. Uh, the glider starts at the surface, um, gets a position fix from GPS. Um, here's the glider. Uh, this is the antenna. I, it's not stuck in there right now um, because it wouldn't fit under here, but normally it's stuck in there. It pokes that antenna up out of the water and gets a GPS fix from it um, and communicates with shore when it needs to. And then inside here, it's got a, um, a bladder and when it deflates the bladder, it gets um, more dense than water. Um, it's, it's very carefully ballasted, so it's very close to the density of seawater. When it deflates the bladder, it gets denser than water, so it starts to sink. And, and instead of sinking straight down, just like a uh, bladder in the air, it has wings that make it go forward through the water as it sinks. So it flies downward. When it gets to a certain preset depth, it inflates that bladder, so it becomes less dense than, than seawater and comes up, and again flies forward as it comes up. So it makes a series of these dives, you know, descents and ascents, and descent and ascent, and moves forward through the water as it goes. Every time it comes to the surface, it pokes the antenna out of the water and calls home. Um, we have a base station uh, that it can call via the Iridium, Iridium satellite network. And um, so it can, it uploads its data about how well it's working and what it's found, and it can download new instructions from the pilot who, uh, who, is, who is flying it. These dives take somewhere around five hours each out in deep water, a thousand meters deep or deeper, which is the depth that it dives to, um, somewhere between four and six hours. Um, as it goes, it also collects oceanographic information, salinity and temperature as it dives to different depths um, and the acoustic data that I'm most interested in. Um, the um, glider is piloted. There's uh, Celine, um, she is a master pilot. And um, she is currently piloting those screens on those things on her computer screens are all about piloting. Um, the pilot the pilot controls the glider direction. Um, you give it a series of waypoints to to move between, and it can aut autonomously go to the next waypoint and follow a series of waypoints if you want to go that far. Uh, the pilot kind of monitors how it's doing and makes sure everything is trimmed right so that it flies well. The plot at the bottom is a um, track of uh, glider dives over the course of a, of a mission. Uh, that glider started out on the continental shelf, so it couldn't dive all that deep, but then it got out into water more than a thousand meters deep and did a long series of thousand meter dives. And then at the end, came back into shallow water. Um, so you can see the dives getting less deep there. Um, so that's kind of a typical dive track for a glider. Uh, that one spans over a month. Um, we often fly our gliders for two months at a time, and I'm looking at pushing it to three months at a time at this point. Why do we want to use gliders for acoustic monitoring? Um, they can go a long distance, 12 to 1800 kilometers um, per flight of the glider. Um, so you can send them out on these pretty long tracks. They go for long durations, two to three months. Uh, the limit on how long they can stay out is battery capacity. They're powered by batteries. 
and they run off batteries for that length of time. Um, they don't have any way of harvesting energy from the ocean, so it's all in there when if, when you when you launch them. Uh -huh. um, so that's the limiting factor in, in how long a glider can go. Um, they managed to stay out that long running on batteries because they're extremely low power. They're on the order of one watt um, averaged over the course of a dive cycle, and that includes how much energy it takes to run their pumps to do the diving and steering as they go, and also um, the communication with shore. It turns out to be pretty power hungry, um, but averaged over the course of a dive, it's about a watt. Um, gliders, we like gliders because compared to vessels, they're very low cost. Uh, a glider mission might, um, deploying it, you know, all going out to sea and um, operating it and, and refurbishing it at the end can cost on the order of $20,000, $30,000. Um, and that is, you know, a day or two worth of uh, ship time on a large vessel. Um, so it, um, you know, you get two or three months worth of data. It's not as rich a data set as you get from a ship, but um, but the, the cost comparison is, is not all that close. Um, also, one of the reasons I went over to using gliders <laughs> is that they're very low carbon compared to vessels. Um, NOAA PMEL, the Pacific Marine Environmental Lab, the, the part of NOAA that I'm part of, um, did a, a study sometime 15 years ago or so to look at how much carbon PMEL um, produces in the course of its operations. So that included everything from heating the building um, to you know running the lights and phones, all the people commuting to work, ship time, everything that PMAL did that that put carbon into the atmosphere, and found that something like 90% of the carbon that PMAL produced was due to ship ship use. You know, kind of all the rest, all the all the uh, other things that you think of as carbon emitting were kind of in the noise. It was it was ship time. Um, so partly for this reason, NOAA is pushing the use of autonomous platforms um, because they don't. You know, they don't, a glider doesn't produce any carbon while it's going. It takes some to get it launched and everything, but it's it's very small compared to operating a ship. Uh, another factor is that um, in using gliders for acoustic monitoring is that gliders are very quiet. Um, anybody who's ever done acoustics off a ship knows how how loud the ship itself is, and also flow noise. Ships typically move at ten knots or something like that, and that makes a huge amount of noise on any kind of uh, uh, um, hydrophone you're dragging along behind the ship. Gliders move at about half a knot and make very little noise, very little flow noise over the hydrophone. They occasionally make internal noises, but it's occasional. There's not very much of the time they do that. Um, so um, we can get good acoustic data almost all the time, uh, something like 94% of the time that a glider is out there. And that chart at the bottom shows the time during which we were um, able to record during a glider mission, you can see those those are dive tracks showing the glider going down to a thousand meters and back up to the surface. Um, the acoustic recording system turns off at the surface because that's a very noisy place, and very briefly at the bottom of a dive, but it's on the rest of the time. So you can see that it's it's uptime is is very good. It can collect a lot of data. Uh, oh, I mentioned gliders are slow, so they make very little flow noise, but it's not zero flow noise. Uh, this was a study that Celine. Um, did Celine Fergosi. Um, this um, diagram shows uh, at the top, the white lines are a glider um, depth chart. Uh, on the right, right axis shows the depth of the glider. So it's diving to 1,000 meters and going back to the surface, that zigzag line. <laughs> um, it's diving a little bit faster than it's ascending. You can see the zigzags are not quite symmetric. And that means it's moving faster when it's diving. And that turned out to have a significant influence on the flow noise. And you can see that at the bottom, um, the part labeled flow noise, uh, you can see the flow noise has wiped out the fin whale calls that you can see when the glider was moving slower on the ascent. So on the descent, it's, it's faster and noisier, and on the ascent, it's slower, and you can suddenly hear the fin whales that you couldn't hear during the descent. So um, this mainly affects low-frequency low species, blue and fin whales, um, but it is a factor to keep in mind that gliders do make some noise. Um, so how do we analyze data, analyze the acoustic data that we get? Uh, the simplest way is um, through something called long-term spectral averaging. We just look at the visual representation of the sound. Um, it's, it's, this is a lot like a spectrogram. Time is on the x-axis and frequency is on the y-axis. 
and how bright it is represents how much energy the, uh, there is at each frequency over time. Um, there are a series of lines there, which are glider noise. Uh, that's the noise of the glider pumping and whatnot every once in a while. Uh, in this case, it's uh, the glider is doing a turn to keep itself on, on track. Um, but there are also a lot of sperm whales present in this. And so you can scan through your data and find the whale sounds um, manually like this. Another way to do it is with automated detection, which is something I've worked a lot on over my career. Um, you can take a sound signal and process it and analyze it for, in various ways and end up with something called a detection function, which represent a pro rep represents a probability over time that you've got a call of the type that you're looking for. And if you apply a threshold to that, then you can uh, uh, identify individual detections. There are also now uh, machine learning, um, deep learning things that we're doing to identify, identify sounds. Um, this was one where I was looking at harbor porpoises um, and used a, a deep learning method to identify harbor porpoises and came out with pretty good performance on it. Um, and there's some other machine learning techniques, um, tree-based classifiers and whatnot that, that people use all the time to analyze these acoustic data sets we get from the glider. Uh, and in using a glider, um, one of the key questions that um, Celine has looked at a, a bunch uh, is, does the glider go where we want it to? Or how well does it go where you want it to? And um, let me see, I'm going to try and you can see. So this is a project we did um, looking at um, uh, glider tracks in Hawaii. We launched the glider off the big island, one over here on the east side and one over there on the west side. Um, the black lines here are where we intended the glider to go. The red lines um, are where the glider actually went, and you can see that they line up quite well over most of the track. Things are typically squirrely at the beginning before you have the glider trimmed right, um, and so things go off track. Over here, it, this was actually a decision we made to launch from a different place than we originally thought we were going to launch. Um, so that wasn't the, a glider problem, that was just our decision. Uh, sometimes the glider does veer off course, like right here. Um, uh, we suddenly encountered a current we didn't expect, and the glider kind of got swept off to the side. But for the most part, the glider sticks to its track very well. It goes where you ask it to, which, uh, which is a really nice thing when you're trying to do a survey of a specific area. Okay, let's see. Um, what do we do with uh, the gliders? Um, or why, why, why do we want to use them? Uh, we use them for long-distance surveys. Um, covering a lot of ground, uh, sometimes long duration surveys where we want to monitor an area over time uh, for exploration, for finding new things, um, and sometimes for soundscape and oceanographic characterization as well. So going through those in turn, long distance surveys, here are uh, a couple of examples. This was a survey we did off Southern California. Um, the red box on the left shows the area um, covered by the map maps on the right. And uh, so these are kind of some typical kinds of results you get from glider surveys. Um, this is the glider track. It started here and followed the track, and then we picked it up over here. Um, the spots along this track uh, indicate how many, um, are, uh, how many of the, the given species um, we heard. So this is a track. For, this is a plot of the sperm whale detections that we got, and you can see that we had them mostly out in deep water. Although there are some shallow ones in here, um, there. And up on the up on the shelf slope, um, where we where we heard sperm whales where we didn't expect to. Um, on the right is humpback whale, and we got considerably more humpback whales than we did sperm whales on this survey. Uh, uh, you can see the the density of um, of detections, you know, all through the deep water parts and a lot of the shallow water parts too, for humpback whales. Um, so that gives us information about where they are and when. Fin whales are kind of like humpback whales that we heard them uh, almost continuously throughout the the uh, the course of the thing. And when I when I first saw this, I thought, oh, okay, maybe there's only one fin whale out there, and the sounds are traveling so far that we're just hearing it everywhere along the track. Um, but then we got the blue whale results, and there there are blue whales out there. There's some detections here, uh, but we're not hearing it anywhere but in the the one place where we detected it. Um, uh, the, the sound doesn't propagate that far in shallow water. And um, that convinced me that we were actually hearing more fin whales. We weren't just hearing, you know, one or one fin whale, one group of fin whales um, throughout this track, that we were actually hearing a lot of different animals along the way. 
Uh, we also use, um, in addition to long distance surveys, we use them for long duration things. This was a project in the Gulf of Mexico, um, close to the Deepwater Horizon uh, disaster site. We um, just flew the glider around a triangle, which you can see on the right, those three red dots indicate the triangle that we were aiming for. Um, and there's the glider track. Uh, we deployed it um, uh, over here and flew it north to somebody wanted to do a different experiment. And then we flew it back and just basically flew, flew around the triangle for a long time and then sent it over off to the east to get recovered. That's where the recovery vessel was. Um, and so this was just a survey to look over time about where things are occurring. Um, here are sperm whale detections in that area, which are the target species for this, this project. And you can see um, that the sperm whales are there on some of the circuits uh, and not present on other ones. Um, so that gave us temporal information about when sperm whales are present in this area and, and where. So that's, a, that's another kind of result that we get from these glider surveys. Um, this is another one. We're working off the um, west coast of the Big Island of Hawaii, uh, surveying various different species here. Um, beaked whales, which are Cuvier's beaked whales and Blainville's beaked whales in this case. Uh, a large host of delphinids were there, and then sperm whales. And um, the glider kind of flew back and forth along this track, and um, we gathered information about when they're there. The right panel shows an analysis looking at diel variation for those species. Um, the beaked whales, the Ziphiidae at the top, um, don't have any noticeable diel pattern. Uh, the dolphinids have quite a noticeable pattern where they're, they're uh, active at night and quiet during the day. The sperm whale, the, the green ones there, um, the green pot, um, seem to show some diel variation, but it turned out to not be sig statistically significant. Um, and then there are also some man-made sounds. The yellow plot at the bottom is for an echo sounder um, showing uh, uh, man-made sounds are common during the day and mostly absent at night. Um, another example of a long-distance survey was up in Alaska. So the inset down at the bottom of these plots shows the Gulf of Alaska, and the little box shows the, uh, the area of the, the bigger plot. Um, we flew gliders along uh, tracks um, zigzagging across the continental shelf slope there. And we got um, some sounds that we think are possible Stenegers beaked whale. Uh, we're not certain about this one, um, but they occurred, most of them occurred toward the bottom part of the plot, but they're, they're scattered throughout. Um, the same was true of killer whales. They're more evenly scattered all along the way. And then on the right shows sperm whales, and you can see the large number of white dots there and, and large numbers of call detections means that there were a lot of sperm whale clicks received. So sperm whales are quite common in this area. Um, we heard them basically all the time that we were out. Uh, this is a survey we've been doing for the last couple of years off of Hawaii, um, looking for false killer whales. And um, we flew two gliders along the length of the main Hawaiian Islands chain. That's kind of a, um, gives you an idea of how, how far we can fly a glider, uh, just doing this zigzag shallow water out to deep, back to shallow, out to deep again, all the way along the chain. And um, some of the false killer whale signals are, are shown in spectrograms on the right there. Those are their whistle sounds and some of their click sounds. Um, and then the plots on the left show where we detected those false killer whales. Um, so that gives us an idea of where they are uh, ar around the Hawaiian Islands. There are, um, that population is an endangered population around the, the um, or threatened forget, threatened or endangered um, around the Hawaiian Islands. So they're of high concern for everybody, um, the, for, for NOAA folks out there. Um, so this was useful information for everybody to learn about where they are. Uh, we also do some exploration. Um, this was a project, a survey we did over in the Mariana Islands. Um, the top plot shows the um, where the inside of the bottom is. Um, and the Mariana Islands, uh, Navy range complex is outlined in red there, and the area um, in the little black box I'll be showing more about in just a minute. Uh, but we got this call type that um, nobody had ever heard before. Uh, it sounds like this. It's truly one of the stranger uh, kinds of marine mammal sounds that I've ever heard, um, partly because it goes from really low sounds to really high 
high frequency sound, high pitch sounds. Um, but also the, the rhythm of it and just everything about it is, is strange. We didn't know what it was. Um, we um, examined all the data for it and then figured out where it was occurring. So uh, the plots on the right show where we heard this call. Um, for the most part, we heard it south of Guam. We heard it out in deep water. Um, you can see the detections there are all out over the, um, the trench, the Mariana Trench. Um, north of Guam, it seemed to be only in shallow water and not in the trench. Uh, we have no idea why this might be the case. Um, maybe they don't, they don't care about the difference between shallow and deep water in this area. I'm not sure. But uh, th that was our, uh, our, our um, assessment of where, where they were occurring. Uh, Sharon Newkirk um, wrote, up, wrote this up, and we speculated that maybe it was a kind of Mickey whale or something, because it bore some resemblance to other Mickey whales in the Pacific, but we really didn't know. We called it the Western Pacific bio twang um, to avoid um, you know, assigning it to species. Uh, and a, a few years later, um, Marie Hill and colleagues published something saying they had recorded this, this sound in the presence of Brutus whales on uh, 20 different occasions. Um, so they, they were pretty sure it was Brutus whales. And then they said, well, we're not sure if it were Brutus whales or Omuro's whales, because we can't tell the difference at sea yet. Um, so it's, it's probably one of those two species. And the kind of the taxonomy of the Brutus whale group, um, I think, is still uncertain enough that um, uh, we, don't, we won't know what to call them until that gets sorted out a little bit better, too. So uh, we also do some non-marine mammal things with the sounds. Uh, soundscape characterization is a big one. Uh, so the uh, map on the left shows um, a glider flight we did in the Gulf of Mexico. Again, the inset shows the whole Gulf and where the uh, where the bigger map is, that little, that little rectangle there. Um, so we flew from over near Florida, uh, DeSoto Canyon over there, out um, down the canyon and then out across some deep water and then up Mississippi Canyon, um, just south of the mouth of the Mississippi up there, and um, characterize the soundscape. So we look at how loud it is at various different frequencies over time as we go. The, um, the plot on the right is showing three different regions. Uh, the, uh, the top region is DeSoto Canyon, um, up to that, um, from the launch of the glider here, up to that red dot, and then the Middle plot shows the deep water basically over to the next red dot, which is here, and then going up Mississippi Canyon. Um, incidentally, we had a hard time piloting the glider up Mississippi Canyon because the water gets shallow and gliders don't work very well, or this glider doesn't work very well in shallow water. Um, so it started to get squirrely to get it to where we wanted it to go. We eventually did, but it was, uh, it was tricky and Celine was, was uh, uh, having to really work to get the glider to go the right way. So the plots on the right show, again, the glider dives at the top, those little zigzags, and then the, um, the soundscape, um, the frequency versus amplitude versus time plots, um, louder amplitudes or brighter colors. And so you can see that DeSoto Canyon is significantly quieter than many of the others, especially down at these low frequencies down here. Um, there's a lot more noise here than there is uh, in DeSoto Canyon. And, um, uh, people are, are becoming more and more interested in soundscape information like this um, because of the impact that sound has on marine mammals. And so just getting the basic information uh, is still a very useful thing to do. Uh, this is another way of looking at some of that data, you know, how the, the um, thickest lines in that graph are the median sound levels at different frequencies. So um, the sound in a given area, say in DeSoto Canyon, the blue line at the bottom, um, sound is louder than that level 50% of the time and quieter than that level the other 50% of the time. And similarly for the, the deep part of the, uh, of the traversal and the, um, the drive up Mississippi Canyon. Mississippi Canyon, for the most part, is the loudest by far. Um, it's the most heavily industrialized. Also, there's a lot of oil and gas work that goes on there. And so um, we kind of expected that to be loud, but we didn't expect the deep water to be quite as loud as it was. Uh, we also can, one of the nice things about gliders is that they measure oceanographic variables as they go also. They collect um, temperature and salinity information, and that allows you to calculate the sound speed, and that in turn allows you to do acoustic propagation modeling to figure out how far sounds can go. 
Um, and so here are some of the things that, um, some of the plots showing just the kind of data that you get from gliders, temperature data, sound speed data that you calculate. Uh, you also get current speed. Uh, the glider does dead reckoning every time it dives. And so it has an idea of, you know, what direction it was going and how fast and it figures out, okay, here's where I should have come up. And then it, you know, when it gets a new GPS sticks, it figures out where it actually did come up. And you can, you know, take the difference between those and figure out what the, what the current was that swept you away from where you expect it to come up. So you can get um, current speed and direction um, from glider dives as you go. Um, and that can be really useful also. So now I'm going to switch topics a little bit um, to a project I've been working on, which is something I've wanted to do for years and uh, finally got the opportunity to start working on uh, a year and a half ago, two years ago, um, which is doing uh, real-time detection. So having a glider out there that can detect um, different species as it goes on board and let you know in real time. Um, typically, when we fly a glider, we just record sounds um, to an internal storage unit. And then when we get the glider out of the water, we get the, the chip out of there and get the sounds off it and then analyze them and figure out what happened. But with uh, real time systems, the glider is doing that analysis as it flies and letting you know what it's found out there. Um, so, uh, and then it, then it reports to shore saying what, um, you know, that it's found the target species, whatever you wanna be, whatever species you're looking for. Um, we want to do this for a variety of reasons. Um, one is to use the glider to find a certain species. Um, I was in talks with Lisa Balance a little while back about finding a beaked whale off the coast here. I didn't yet have this real-time system, so I wasn't able to help her out, but it's something I would like to do. Um, to find a rare species or an unknown species um, that you want to identify the sound of, uh, you, could, you can use this real-time system. Basically, you send the glider out there, on a survey and when it finds something, you can launch people from shore to go identify the species or maybe do other kinds of work, biopsy or photo ID or look at group associations and behavior and all kinds of things that you can do when you're on a group of marine mammals. But having a glider out there as your scout essentially to find something that's, you know, some uncommon species could be really helpful. Um, another potential use is to warn ships and um, fishing vessels and whatnot of a species presence. This is something you might use, you know, for uh, um, endangered species like right whales, uh, where you don't want the ships to hit them. Um, so um, there, there are a variety of uses for the real time idea. It's a challenging thing to do on a glider. Um, there are three things that make it especially difficult. One is that gliders have to operate on very little power because they're battery, op battery operated um, you want your system to use a watt or less of power, um, which is an incredibly tiny amount of electricity. Um, uh, so you have to do special processing things so that your processing is computationally efficient and doesn't use up very much power. Gliders also have very little physical, sea gliders have very little physical space inside. Um, I think that's changing with new, new versions of sea gliders that are coming out, but the one we had had about 10 cubic inches of space. It's just like this little um, volume of space to work in. And then the last thing is that the communication with shore is very constricted also because the glider communicates via satellite. Uh, you just can't send a whole lot of data back. Um, the more data you send, the more power you use up also. Um, so it both takes time to communicate the data and a lot of power to send it up to a satellite. Uh, so those are all things that, that we had to deal with. In, uh, in designing a real-time system. So the approach I took was um, the lab I work with, the, the PMEL Acoustics Group, headed by Bob Ziek, um, has been working for years with a company um, that builds this thing called the Wideband Intelligent Signal Processor, the Whisper system, which is an acoustic system for capturing sound. And whispers can have um, processors attached to them that um, can you know, run a separate processing regime and, and analyze sound for you that the whisper has recorded. Uh, so the idea would be to, the idea was to um, make detection algorithms that could pick out a target species and have them run on this, this Raspberry Pi system uh, that's stuck onto the whisper. And um, uh, the, both of those things, the whisper and the Raspberry Pi are very small and low power. The whole thing is about that big. Um, it just fits in a glider, there's a picture of it. Uh, the glider batteries in the back, 
um, the Raspberry Pis, the board on top, and then there are some other boards below it that have the Whisper. And the whole, so the whole thing is sits in there and is very low power. Um, the way it works is that Whisper stores data on two separate um, SD cards. Uh, incoming sound gets recorded to one of those cards, and it makes the other card available to the Raspberry Pi to, um, to process the data. So um, Whisper is recording to one, Raspberry Pi is talking to the other one. After a while, they swap, and the Whisper starts recording to the, to the other one, and the Raspberry Pi starts analyzing the new recordings um, to find, find the target species. So I call it near real time because it's not actually processing the data as it comes in. And it's also near near real time in the sense that the glider can't report what it found until it gets to the surface anyway. So it's kind of doing this every five hours. Um, it's not doing it continuously as the thing runs. So it's near real time. The software um, is uh, based on this thing called the Energy Ratio Maximization Algorithm, or IRMA, uh, something Holger Klink and I have been working on since 2011 or so. Um, it's something designed for very low power autonomous systems at sea, uh, and it um, operates in the time domain, which means it avoids computationally expensive uh, FFTs. The way it works is that it filters a sound signal to find the energy in two separate frequency bands and then takes the ratio of the, those energies. Um, this is something that works well for click sounds, um, especially ones with distinctive spectral features like those of sperm whales, a lot of the beaked whales, many of the delphinids. Um, here's an example. Uh, the picture on the left shows a spectrum. So that has frequency across the horizontal axis and amplitude. The amplitude of the sound at, at each frequency um, is what the curve is plotted there. So a beaked whale has this distinctive rise in its spectrum um, just above 20 kilohertz. So you can see that the curve goes way up right there. Um, Sperm whales do not have this kind of rise. They have a lower frequency rise. So you can take the, the ratio of energies between what's present here and what's present somewhere down here. And um, if that energy ratio is very large, it becomes very likely that you found a, a beaked whale. Um, you have to look at the target species, which in this case was beaked whale, and compare it to all the other species that might be present. But dolphin clicks are the other very common thing for this project, which was in Hawaii. And they don't look nothing at all like beaked whale or sperm whale clicks. So um, we could um, identify beaked whales using this, this ratio method. Uh, there's some means we use to pick out the best frequency bands to take that ratio. Um, you look at the target species and all the other species that might be present, and you eventually end up with a, uh, a point, um, a, a pair of frequencies that are ideal or, or the best for um, finding the, the, the species you care about the most. And in practice, um, it looks like this. You get a um, sound signal. It's plotted as a spectrogram on the top, but that's just for us to look at. It doesn't actually calculate a spectrogram as it goes because that uses an FFT, which is slow. Um, and um, it just takes the energy in one frequency band, which is plotted in the second line, and in another frequency band below it. And then when you take the ratio of those two, you get a detection function. And whenever there are peaks in the detection function, you register a, a detection. So when it gets all those detections, uh, it puts them together into something called a detection report, um, which it sends to shore. And the idea of the detection report is not to have um, perfect, perfect detection, but it's to report enough information back to a person on shore that they can make the decision about whether this is the species that you're looking for. Um, so it's kind of a human in the loop um, approach to doing detection. Uh, detection reports are incredibly boring. There's one on the right. It's just a whole bunch of numbers. Um, but um, it, uh, it's reporting, in this case, the times of click detections. Uh, I've also experimented with, with sending a uh, spectrum of the clicks as well. And using that information, you can plot it up as to when clicks are happening. And a person looking at this, um, me most commonly, um, can look at those and say, OK, those top two look nothing at all like uh, target species, um, but the bottom one does. Um, in, in this case, we were looking for sperm whales. Um, the bottom one looks very much like a, uh, what a pod of sperm whales looks like um, when plotted, the interclick intervals get plotted like that. So um, this is the kind of useful information you can use to say, okay, I found this, this target species. 
uh, I took some further steps to reduce the power of the thing to make it usable on a glider. Um, the Raspberry Pi uses like almost four times as much power as would be feasible to use on a glider, almost four watts. Uh, but the good thing about it is that it can process an entire five hour dive cycle in 16 minutes. So you just turn it on, run it for 16 minutes to process all the sounds that are there and then have it turn itself off. Um, with that kind of duty cycle of the, the Raspberry Pi system, its average over an entire dive cycle is only about a sixth of a watt, which is great. Um, it means it's feasible for doing on a glider. I also realized about a week before I was about to put my glider in the water that if I had a bug in my code with the Raspberry Pi system and it hung up or something, um, it would never shut itself off. It would, the Raspberry Pi would stay on. It, was, it would drain the battery in the glider um, in a pretty short amount of time, and then I would lose the glider. Um, gliders are not cheap, and I didn't want to lose one of them. So I started a, a separate thing that called a watchdog process that simply shuts the, gli shuts the Raspberry Pi system off automatically after a set amount of time so that it couldn't sort of overrun its bounds. And you know, if, it, if there was a bug in my code or something, it would still shut itself down quickly enough that it would, wasn't going to use up the battery in the glider and, and cause it to be lost. It also reports how long it runs for when it's doing the detection process on the Raspberry Pi. So the pilot can keep track of the total energy use during a given glider flight and, and know how much um, power is being drained. So we tested this last spring, last year, uh, just about a year ago right now, actually. Um, we use sperm whales as a test species. And the target species we are, we're ultimately interested in is false killer whales out there, <clears throat> but we weren't sure if we were gonna find them. And so we use sperm whales as a test species um, because we were absolutely certain that we were going to find them. We're all over the place there. And um, sure enough, we, we heard a lot of them. Um, so we put this thing out and on one of the gliders, the one plotted in the yellow dots here, and uh, it worked. Um, it generated detection reports. I could generally tell when, when they represented sperm whales, um, when a, a given encounter represented sperm whales and when it didn't. Um, and uh, and so I was really happy about that. We had over 600 encounters over the five weeks. Um, an encounter is a sequence of detections separated by at least, I think it was 10 minutes from um, any other um, detections of that species. So you can get many encounters on a given dive. Uh, the detector um, reported a lot of false detections. Uh, it turned out about 20, when we got the data back at the end of the whole thing, and compared what the glider had reported with, with, with what ground truth was, what we knew about sperm whale sounds, we found that about 27% of the glider's detections were correct. Um, I expected this because I had set up the whole system to be safe and to, to sort of over-report sperm whale detections. I wanted, to, wanted it to be um, very liberal in what it thought might be a sperm whale so that I wouldn't miss any. Um, and then after checking by a person, um, we got to a correct um, detection level of 77%. Uh, one of the things I would very much like to do is to improve those numbers and um, get, a, get better detectors. And now that I have the data that we got from this flight, I can, I can do that. Uh, the other good news about it was the power use. Um, the Whisper acoustic system use ha uses half a watt. The Raspberry Pi averages a sixth of a watt, and the total is you know, somewhere around 0.7 watt. So it's under the one watt target that we were aiming for um, and so that means that we can use it on these long glider flights. So that was another piece of good news about it. So next step um, is to refine the detector so it you know, makes fewer false detections and um, does better reporting so that I can filter through the data and uh, do a better job of figuring out what, um, uh, what, what's a, really the target species. Um, apply it to other species, especially false killer whales, the one that are most concerned to the people I work with. Um, another thing I didn't mention on here is that we're trying to transition uh, glider use to NOAA. Um, the, the people in the Pacific Islands Fishery Science Center and the Southwest Fishery Science Center, they're very interested in all this um, marine mammal glider stuff. Um, uh, uh, and so a project is just launching now, starting next month, um, to work with them to do glider surveys off the West Coast this year, and again in Hawaii next year, um, to um, help 
continue training people in NOAA about how to use gliders, deploy them, analyze the data, everything else you need to, to know about to use gliders for marine mammal monitoring. Um, Celine has developed a, a software toolkit for piloting gliders to make it easy for people to do. Um, and so that's a key component of it also. And with that, I am done. Uh, thanks to all the people who have helped over the over the years, many, many of them, and the funding agencies. Um, ONR bought my gliders and funded a lot of the early work for, for doing marine mammal surveys, and NOAA is now doing it a lot. So thanks to them too. And thank you for listening. Thank you so very much. Um, so we're gonna just kind of go back and forth and we're gonna start with questions online. So go ahead, Roseanne. Regarding near real-time detection, would it be possible to send raw data to shore and have it processed there to reduce the power draw on the glider used by the processing computer? Uh, no, is the answer. Um, there's way too much raw data to send uh, I mentioned at the beginning that the data packet size has to be about 10 kilobytes. Um, that's like one millisecond worth of data or something at the sample rates that we operate at. Uh, so um, there is far, far, far too much data to be able to send it to shore through the satellite. Um, the limitation is that, that the glider communicates with shore by satellite. And so you just cannot send very much data. Questions in the room? Hi, Dave. <clears throat> great, great progress on this. My question is, what's it going to take to be able to collect eDNA <laughs> and stalk a whale? Yes. Um, so I've talked with uh, Angie Sremba a fair bit about this and, and you a little bit. Um, I would love to be able to do that. Uh, what it's going to take is um, some kind of system that we can build into a glider for collecting eDNA, you know, some way of like pumping water samples through and collecting them on a filter and buffering it so that we can uh, we can recover the samples later on. And also a system for locating whales. Um, one of the things I'd like to do is to be able to put out three or four gliders at a time, have them able to detect whatever species we're, we're looking for. And then um, because there are multiple gliders out there listening, if they're time synchronized, be able to locate where the glider was and then send the, the eDNA collector to that spot to go collect eDNA. So um, we need those things. Uh, far and away, the most complicated part of it is building an eDNA sampler that can you know, go to 1,000 meters and, and uh, the way a glider does and, and survive the, the trip, and then you know, collect the eDNA where and when we want it to. So that's, it's, a, it's a challenging problem, but, but it, it'd be really cool to be able to do it. All right. Questions online. Go ahead, Roseanne. How often can you estimate population numbers from distinctive individual calls? Um, distinctive individuals, uh, some species, uh, you can tell individuals apart. Uh, a lot of species you can't. Mostly the baleen whales, you cannot tell apart. Um, there are, in a bunch of species of dolphins, there are things called signature whistles, which are more or less unique to an individual. Um, so you can tell individuals apart. So um, how well it works varies a lot from species to species, I guess I will say. That said, if you're listening to baleen whales, you know, blue whales in a given population typically all sound pretty similar to each other or very similar to each other. Um, and so, you know, if you hear one now and you heard one tomorrow, you couldn't say, oh, it's the same individual. <laughs> but at a given time, you might hear two or three blue whales um, talking at a time, and you can tell that there are two or three different ones because um, one will be nearer and one will be farther, and so one will be louder and one will be softer. They also call typically in very regular sequences, and so you can look at all the calls out there and start to put them into sequences and say, okay, this call, this call, this call, this call came from that whale, which means that that call, that call, that call, got, that call must have come from another whale, and you can start to count how many you can hear at a time. Um, so you can you can sort of identify individuals over very short time scales that way um, and count how many you're hearing at a time. Um, so there, yeah, people people are working on that. And like I said, we're working on density estimation methods 
for mobile platforms like gliders. And a key part of uh, some of those methods is being able to count how many we're hearing at a time. So we're actively working on that. Questions in the room? Okay, hang on just a second. Yeah, meet me in the middle. That's great. Thank you. Hi, thank you for a really great talk. I was wondering, because you have these battery concerns, um, I imagine that when you can record at a lower sampling rate, you try to, but you also talked about detecting false killer whales and sperm whales. And so I guess it's a two-part question. The first being, what sample rate do you often deploy with? And then also just for curiosity's sake, I, I'm guessing you often are detecting sperm whales through echolocation clicks, but I was curious if you've ever heard CODAs. Yeah. Um, so um, there's um, baleen whales usually have very low frequencies, and Mark Baumgartner has been working with baleen whale sounds and real-time detection on his gliders uh, for a long time. The low frequency means that the processing load is much lower. Um, and one of the reasons I was working on this Irma method is to be able to do high frequency animals like the ones you mentioned and, you know, beaked whales and dolphins and sperm whales and everything else. Um, we are currently typically operating at a sample rate of 180 kilohertz. So we can hear sounds up to 90 kilohertz. I wanted to have that upper limit because it enables me to tell different species apart, different species of beaked whale, especially, um, it doesn't go high enough to hear things like harbor porpoises um, and some of the uh, some of the other porpoises, um, the narrowband high frequency species they're called. But um, often those species are shallow water. You know, harbor porpoise, for instance, is, isn't going to be in a place where you can fly gliders because they're they're very shallow water species and gliders need deep water. So um, right now I'm at hearing sounds up to 90 kilohertz, and um, uh, that you know. I'm happy with that for now. Uh, uh, I'll probably try to increase that as time goes on, but uh, but for now, that's where I am. And then codas ever by any chance for sperm whales? Pardon? Have you recorded codas from codas. sperm whales? Uh, I haven't tried to detect codas. Uh, so far, I'm just detecting regular clicks um, because while they're louder than codas, they're much more common than codas. Um, and so kind of that was the low hanging fruit. Um, to do the first experiments with. Um, and that's true of all the Adonisite species that we're looking at, that we're, we're looking at detecting their echolocation sounds more than the communication sounds. All right, Roseanne, go ahead. Is there any way of using movement through water to recharge batteries? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, from principles of thermodynamics, I would guess no, um, that, you know, if you could, you know, have your glider sink and co collect some energy and then have it rise and collect more energy and more than it takes to pump that bladder out at the bottom, you'd be gaining energy over, over the whole cycle. And that violates the second law of ther thermodynamics. So I think, um, the answer to that is no. Um, I don't know if there might be other ways you could do it by harvesting, wave motion at the surface or something like that? I, I, I don't know. Questions in the room? Roseanne, any other questions online? Yes. Um, have you tested gliders in a cluster for estimating position yet? If so, are there any significant hurdles to accomplish this other than purchasing, operating, and piloting multiple gliders at once? Uh, I have not done this yet. Um, like I said, it's something I would like to do, but we haven't done it yet. Um, yes, you'd have to operate multiple gliders at once. Uh, the challenges are that you would need to detect and recognize um, individual calls on multiple gliders. You have to be able to say, okay, this is the same call I heard on this glider and this glider and this glider. And then you could, you could triangulate the location of the sound source. Um, but you'd have to identify that it's the same call. Um, animals typically make, you know, lots of calls when they when they make sounds, um, echolocation clicks or calls, you know, baleen whale sounds, um, uh, communication calls. Uh, and so you have to be able to distinguish one from another and tell which one is which in order to get the the proper time differences between the the uh, 
the, the receptions at different gliders. Um, so that's a challenge. Um, you know, if you wanted to do it in real time on your gliders, you'd have to have them able to, you know, somehow identify which call is which and be able to sort of um, cross correlate and figure out which, you know, which glider heard which sound at which time and uh, to be able to do the localization. So that's one issue. Um, uh, the, in order to hear the same sound on different gliders, the gliders would have to be close enough to hear the same call. Um, and different species sounds travel different distances. With baleen whales, they can go tens or even hundreds of kilometers. But with a lot of the um, beaked whales and dolphins, the sounds go a handful of kilometers. So your gliders would have to all be in pretty close um, proximity to each other and to the animal that you're trying to, to listen to in order to, to do it. Um, so those are, those are some of the challenges uh, to doing it. I think it's going to be possible to do it with baleen whales um, long before we'll be able to do it with odonocetes uh, because baleen whale calls travel so much farther and that just makes everything easier to do. All right. Any other questions in the room? Okay. Um, you talked about false killer whales and I was just wondering if you've been able to look at any other blackfish species, if you can tell any distinct calls? Uh, we've heard pilot whales, uh, short fin pilot whales out on Hawaii. Um, I haven't studied them very much. We just know that we got them. Um, and there's some plots that show where we where we have them uh, that I didn't show. But uh, that's the main other one that I've looked at. Um, I have not really worked on killer whales at all with, with gliders yet. Um, to, it's a species I would like to work on. Uh, I can't do anything like with the southern resident killer whales um, because they're in much too shallow water and also much too fast of currents for gliders to work very well. You know, gliders only go half a knot. So anywhere up in the Salish Sea is not going to work for uh, for gliders. Um, it would have to be offshore. And so that means, you know, looking at bigs or one of the, you know, some of the, the um, uh, salmon eaters that, that are offshore. All right. Oh, one more. Thanks, Dave. That's fascinating. This is a quick one. Um, I'm wondering how much uh, water temperature affects your battery life. And the reason I'm asking this is because um, I'm wondering what the potential of using this in, let's say, the Southern Ocean, maybe around the polar front would be. Uh, the answer is it undoubtedly affects battery life, but it affects it everywhere. Um, as soon as you leave the surface, like within a few hundred meters, you're down to four degrees Celsius water in most parts of the world. Um, so the glider is spending most of its life in that temperature water anyway, and it doesn't matter if you're in the Southern Ocean or around here. So um, yes, it affects battery life, but but it's about the glider is designed to deal with that. Great. Okay, everybody, let's just give one more round of applause for today's speaker. All right, thank thank you. you so much for being here. And I hope I see all of you next week at a, our uh, special speaker. So come see us. Thanks, everyone.